So this is uh, part two of the uh, September exam uh, questions talk through. So the types of questions talk through. These are all going to be questions related to what would be in your main body. So they're going to be questions that range between one and three marks. So let's get started. So first question, atoms of different elements have different attractions for bonded electrons. What term is used as a measure of the attraction an atom involved in a bond has for the electrons in the bond? Well, that is electronegativity. Okay, don't bother writing sentences, just write single words if you can. Part B. Atoms of different elements are different sizes. What is the trend in atomic size across the period from sodium to argon. Now this just says what is the trend. It doesn't ask you to explain. So the trend as you go across a period atomic size decreases. Okay? For C, atoms of different elements have different ionisation energies. Explain why the first ionisation energy of potassium is less than the first ionisation energy of sodium. So for this, you probably want to look up where potassium and sodium are um, on the table uh, in the data booklet. So we have, oh, sorry, can't see that. Sodium's here. Potassium here. So potassium is lower down. It is lower down in the group. So I would start with that information. Potassium, and if you want to, you can shorten potassium to its symbol. Potassium is lower down group one than sodium. Okay? That doesn't explain it. That's just saying an outline. And it has more electron shells. If it has more electron shells, a potassium electrons are shielded more from the attraction or the attractive force of the nucleus. So easier to remove. So kind of have to say a few things just to get those two marks. So potassium is lower down group one than sodium. It has more electron shells. It has more shielding from the attractive force of the nucleus, or you could say the positive protons, and so the electrons are easier to remove. It's a full answer. Next question is the dreaded, but unnecessarily so, open-ended question. Now, this one says, the terms opposites attract is commonly used to describe relationships. Using your knowledge of chemistry, comment on how relevant this term is to chemistry. Now this question has hardly any information given to you, and there's three marks. Now when it comes to marks for open-ended questions, you can answer the question in two ways. You can either pick one topic related to the question and go into it in a lot of detail. We'd call that answering the question using depth. Or you can talk about lots of different things in a small amount of detail, and that would be answering the question in breadth. Both can get you three marks. For me, if I was approaching this question, I would just constantly think about opposites attracting. And to me, when I hear attract, that is bonding to me. And I am not going to waste any time writing in sentences for this question. 
I'm going to say opposite charges attract. And then I'm going to basically create a table where I'm going to say bonding, positive, negative. And I'm going to talk about all the types of bonding I know. So firstly, I'm going to talk about an atom. And that is positive nucleus, negative electrons. Okay, that one you might not, that might not instinctively come to your mind, but that's what's holding an atom together. Next one, ionic bonding. Well, that is positive ions and negative ions. Um, next, okay, metallic. That is positive metal ions. And negative uh, delocalized electrons. Covalent. Uh, nuclei. And shared electrons. I've probably got two marks at that point. I could go into intermolecular bonding. And what I would probably say is I'd draw an example of maybe water and another water molecule. I would put on delta positives, delta negative, delta positive, delta positive, delta negative, delta positive, and I would show that that's a hydrogen bond, and that is um, opposite charges. If you wanted to, you could also go into dipole-dipole, so something like that. Um, this is just an example I can think of. You could have done a carbon with a chlorine around it, and that's delta negative, that's delta positive, that's delta positive, that's delta negative. So we've got permanent dipole. permanent dipole and that's also opposite charges. I've covered enough there to get three marks. I've talked about so many examples of opposites attracting and I've written hardly anything on the bit of paper. These diagrams are much easier to draw than it is to write down words. This table much easier to talk about the positive things, the negative things, and given a list and using abbreviated words than trying to write out pages and pages of sentences. Use bullet points. Use abbreviations. Use chemical symbols instead of the names of chemicals. Anything that's going to save you time. That is one of the more difficult questions because it gives you hardly any information. But I hope that I've shown that if you just break it down and think about what you know, you can quite simply put things together and you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to write in paragraphs. You don't have to write in sentences. You don't even have to properly answer the question. Just write down anything you know related to the topic. So we're going to move on to the next question. So this is, we've been given a an equation. Methanol plus propanoic acid goes to methyl propanoate and we've got water here. It says that 40.4 grams of methyl propanoate is obtained. So that's that. 
So to me, if that's what is obtained, I'm thinking actual yield. I'm not even reading the rest of the question. That is what was obtained. That's my actual yield. And it's from 18.3 grams of methanol. Okay, so this is what I've been asked about and this is what I've been told about as well. Calculate the percentage yield. We've not been told anything about the propanoic acid, so we just have to assume we can do everything based on methanol. So we can do this looking at moles. What we need is our GFM. So we have one carbon, that's 12. We've got three hydrogens, that's three. We've got an oxygen, that's 16. And we've got another hydrogen, that's one. When we add that together, we get 32. For methylpropanoate, okay, we've got two carbons, that's 24, plus five hydrogens, that's five, plus a carbon, that's 12, plus two oxygens, that's 16 times two, which is 32, plus a carbon, that's 12, and three hydrogens, so that's three. Um, that one, I can't just add together easily in my head, so I'm going to use my calculator. 24 plus 5 plus 12 plus 32 plus 12 plus 3 equals 88. So I have 18.3 as my mass, 18.3, and my GFM is 32. So my number of moles is 18.3 divided by 32. And that's quite a long number. So I got, if you can see, 0.571875. I'm going to keep four decimal places there. I'm going to say that 0.5719 moles. My ratio is 1 to 1 because I've not got any numbers at the top. So that means I should be getting 0 0.5719 moles of this. My GFM is 88. M equals N times GFM, which equals 0 0.5719 multiplied by 88 equals 50.3, and I'm going to round it up because this is to one decimal place, so only for my final figure. That is my theory, okay? And percentage yield is actual divided by theoretical multiplied by 100, which is 40.4 divided by 50.3, multiplied by 100, so 40.4, to show you that I'm actually doing it, 40.4 divided by 50.3 equals, and then multiply that by 100, 80.3%. So that's two marks. Next, we've got atom economy. Now, remember, atom economy is uh, mass of desired divided by total of desired product divided by total mass of reactants multiplied by 100. So, the mass of desired product, it's only from the equation. So our mass of desired product is going to be 88. All the calculations there we ignore. For percentage, uh, for atom economy, we're just looking at the equation. That's 88. That's our top. So that is our desired product here. Our reactants is this one and this one. Now that three is just part of the question, so I'm not going to let that distract me. I know my GFM of methanol, that's going to be 32 plus, and I just need to work out my GFM of this. So I've got two times carbon, five times hydrogen, 
1 times carbon, 2 times oxygen, 1 times hydrogen. So that is 2 times 12, 5 times 1, uh, 1 times 12, 2 times 16, and 1 times 1. So that's 12, 5, 12, 32, and 1. So 12 plus 5 plus 12 plus 32 plus 1, that equals 62. So I'm going to add 62 there. So that's 88 divided by 94 multiplied by 100. And 88 divided by 92, 100, it gives me 95.65 everything. I'm going to, because everything else has been to one decimal place, I'm going to use one decimal place. So 95.7%. Okay. Next question. Next question. Name the element. So we've been given sodium to argon. Those are period three of the periodic table. Name the element that exists as a covalent network. So this is one, sodium's a metal, magnesium's a metal, aluminium's a metal. So it's definitely none of those. Argon is a um, noble gas, so it's monoatomic. Phosphorus, sulfur, and chlorine, those are all molecules, P4, S8, and Cl2. So that leaves us silicon. You can just write the symbol. Ionization energy changes across the period. Explain why. So this one needs an explanation. Why the first ionization energy increases across a period. So we're going across a period. So we're going to have increased number of protons. which means more positive charge, which means electrons have more attraction, or you could say nucleus has more attraction uh, to the electrons, or nucleus has more attraction to the uh, so electrons have more attraction to the nucleus and held closer to a uh, nucleus. Something along those lines. But you want to talk about your increased number of protons having more positive charge and the electrons being more attracted to the nucleus or the nucleus being more attracted to the electrons, making them closer. Okay? So the next question, write an equation including state symbols for the second ionization energy of magnesium. So it is the second ionization energy. Remember in each ionization energy we are giving off one mole of electrons. Okay, so only one mole of electrons on this side and we are the second ionization energy. So that means we're going to end up as an Mg. 2 plus ion, and if we've lost one electron, that means we already were an Mg plus ion. Because this is an ionization energy, it's one mole of electrons in the gaseous state, so we need to make sure that everything's a gas. You can put gas on the electrons, but it's not necessary, because it is the second ionization energy. So we're going to end up there. Our next question shows the values table of the first four ionization energies of aluminium. So the first was 578, second 1817, the third 2745, and the fourth is 11577. Why is there a large difference between the third and fourth? So the reason, it's only one mark, so the fourth electron is 
if we remember aluminium is in group 3 so Al is in group 3 so once it's lost 3 electrons 4th electron means you're breaking a new shell and a full electron shell So that's why. Fourth electron, you're breaking a full shell. If you include that aluminium is in group three, that's leading them to know why the fourth electron is breaking the shell. Okay. Now this is still related to that. Um, and it says that the boiling point of chlorine is higher than argon. Explain fully in terms of structure and the type of van der Waals forces present. So remember, you're going to have to put something about structure. You're going to have to put something about the type of van der Waals forces. Why the boiling point of chlorine is higher than that of argon. So anytime you get a question like this, when it says the boiling point of chlorine is higher than that of argon, that means chlorine has stronger forces than um, argon. We haven't, we don't have to identify what those forces are, that should get you one mark. We will then go on to discuss what those forces are. So chlorine is diatomic, Cl2. Because it's Cl2, there's no difference in electronegativity, so that means it's non-polar. Argon is monoatomic because it's a noble gas. So that's also non-polar. They don't have any ionic, metallic, or covalent network bonding, so the only forces are intermolecular so that's we've covered that's our structure our only forces are intermolecular and because they're nonpolar london dispersion forces So that we've covered that. We then need to say why is chlorine going to have stronger forces than argon when we're thinking about London dispersion forces? Well chlorine has more electrons. That's the thing that makes London dispersions weaker or stronger. So chlorine has more electrons than argon, which is why it has stronger London dispersion forces. Okay, see again, I'm not writing in proper sentences most of the time. I'm writing notes and I'm still getting three marks for that. So always start off saying one of them has stronger forces than the others. Whichever one has the higher boiling point or melting point has your stronger forces. Then it asks you about structure. Chlorine is diatomic, Cl2. Argon is monoatomic. That means you've definitely covered that point. Then it talks about the van der Waals forces. When we're thinking about van der Waals forces, we need to know are the molecules polar or nonpolar? Chlorine and argon are both nonpolar, so the type of intermolecular force is a London dispersion force. That's us covered that second point. And to make sure we get that third point, we need to explain why chlorine will have stronger London dispersion forces than argon, and it's because it has more electrons. 
being a bigger molecule and having more electrons is the only reason why something can have stronger London dispersion forces than another molecule. So just tick off in the question, what are the things I need to talk about? As long as you've talked about those and you've made an explanation for why, you should get all three marks. Okay, I'm going to move on. So here we have another type of bonding question. Phosphine, PH3, is used as an insecticide in the storage of grain. Phosphine can be produced by the reaction of water with aluminium phosphide. Okay, so this is our phosphine. We've got an equation. State the type of bonding and structure in phosphine. So it's bonding and structure. So it is phosphorus and hydrogen. I'm going to know those are both non-metals, so it's going to be covalent. Now I want to think about, is it going to be polar or non-polar? So I'm going to turn to my data booklet. Hydrogen is there, it's got a uh, 2.2. Phosphorus is here, it's also 2.2. So it's going to be non-polar. And we can count the number of atoms, we've got phosphorus in three, so it's molecular. So that's covered all the possibilities. It's covalent, it's a molecule, and it's non-polar. Okay? Our next question reads, 2.9 kilograms of aluminium phosphide, so aluminium phosphide is this, were used in a phosphine generator. Calculate the volume of phosphine gas. Well, phosphine gas, and it does say that it's a gas. So we're going to be thinking about molar volume. So what is the volume of phosphine gas that would have been produced? So the first thing we need to think about is what do we know? Well, we have got aluminium phosphide and it is going to pH 3. So aluminium phosphide, we can look up and work out its GFM. So the relative atomic mass of aluminium is 27. And the relative atomic mass of phosphorus, when we look it up, is 31. So when we add those together, we get 58. 58 grams. We were told the mass is 2.9 kilograms. Now, if we need to turn that into grams, so we multiply by 1,000 to give us 2,900 grams. For phosphine, we have, we know that the molar volume is 24. That's all we know so far. On this side, what we're going to do is we are going to work out a number of moles. So that's going to be 2900 N equals M divided by GFM. So that's going to be 2900 divided by 58, which I think it's about 500, but we'll see. 2900 divided by 58 is 50. 50 moles. Now our mole ratio is 1 to 1. So if you have 50 here, you're going to have 50 there. Now we have got molar volume and we've got a number of moles. And it is volume equals number of moles multiplied by mole volume is the equation. 
So we're going to have 50 multiplied by 24, which equals 1,200 litres. That does seem like a big number, but remember you started with kilograms of this, so you expect probably to have thousands of this. Next question. Carbon dioxide is fed into the phosphine generator to keep the phosphine concentration less than 2.6%. Above this level, phosphine can ignite due to the presence of diphosphine, P2H4. It's a gas as an impurity. Draw a structural formula for diphosphine. So structural formula, that just means the symbols connected by lines representing bonds. So that, all that information in the question, completely unnecessary. All we're thinking about is that it is P2H4. Now, whenever it comes to that, we need to know how many bonds does each type of atom form. Phosphorus is in group 5. If it's in group 5, it has a valency of 3. Hydrogen is... Um, well, group 1 or group 7, and it has a valency of 1. So that means each uh, phosphorus needs 3 bonds, and each hydrogen needs 1 bond. So I would start with a phosphorus. It needs 3 bonds, so 1, 2, 3. Uh, and... We've got another phosphorus. If we put all hydrogens around it, we'd have nothing for anything to bond to because each hydrogen can only bond to another, uh, can only bond to one thing, sorry. So one of these is going to have to go to a phosphorus. And that's got one bond already, so it needs two more. And we've got four hydrogens to put in. So if we count, that hydrogen has one bond, that has one bond, that has one bond, that has one bond. This phosphorus has one, two, three. That phosphorus has one, two, three. So that's been met. That's been met for every single one. And we've got two and four. So they can do that with simple molecules like that. Right. Question six. So this... I can immediately see the word limiting reagent, so I've got alarm bells going off. This is excess. I've been told 0 0.4 grams of sodium sulfite, Na2SO3, is reacted with 50 centimetres cubed of dilute hydrochloric acid um, of concentration 1 mole per litre. I've been given a GFM mass of one mole for uh, um, sodium sulfite. And the question asks, show that sodium sulfite is a limiting reagent. Okay, so we don't need to worry about any of our products. It's just these two things. So at some point, let's write our molar ratio. So that's one to two. For sodium sulfite, our mass is 0 0.4 grams. Our GFM is 126.1 grams. For hydrochloric acid, our volume is 50 centimetres cubed, which is 0 0.05 litres. Our concentration is 1. For each of these, we're going to work out the number of moles. So 0 0.4... Uh, so N equals M divided by GFM, which equals 0 0.4 divided by 126.1. So on my calculator out, I'll get this way because it seems to be brighter. 0 0.4 divided by 126.1 equals that. Now it's times 10 to the 3. So that just means I'm going to take that decimal. Sorry, going to take this decimal place. One, two, three. So that means there's going to be two zeros in front of it. So zero point zero zero, and I always keep three or four numbers. So I'm going to write three one seven moles for that. 
For this one, n is equal to cv, which is 1 times 0 0.05, which equals 0 0.05. That's what I have. Okay? Now what I need to think about, if I have this, my ratio is 1 to 2. So if I have that number of that, I have 0 0.00317, I'm going to need 2 times that, so 0 0.00317, which equals 0 0.00634. So that's what I need. So for nitric acid, or sorry, for HCl, I have no, I've made a mistake. 0 0.04, let's show that that's the limiting reagent. Uh, I have 0 0.05. Yes, I have more. Sorry, I was reading my decimal points wrong. I've got 0 0.05 and I need 0 0.0065. So I have more than I need. Which that means it's in excess. That means that my sodium sulfite is limiting. So don't make the mistake I almost made. There's two decimal places there, but only one is, so two zeros there, one zero there. So I definitely um, need less than I have. I have more than I need. And that's why we have that there. Just shows you anyone can get confused from time to time. Right, so for question seven, we're getting near the end. So thank you for sticking with me through this video. Elements in the third period of the periodic table form chlorides. The structure of these three, of three of these chlorides are shown. So we've got silicon with chloride around it, we have got phosphorus with chlorides, and we've got sulfur with chloride. Circle the structure of the molecule above that contains bonds with the lowest polarity. Polarity, we are thinking electronegativity. So in each case, we've got silicon, and then we've got chlorine on this one. We have got, uh, uh, sorry, in each one we've got chlorine. That one's got silicon, that one's got phosphorus, that one's got sulfur. I'm going to look up my data booklet for all of my electronegativities. Uh, so that is on this page. So silicon is... Sorry, silicon is here. It has an electronegativity of 1.9. Phosphorus, I know I looked this up just previously, phosphorus is 2.2. And sulfur is here, sulfur is 2.5. Chlorine. Uh, chlorine is 3.0, and that's going to be in all of them. So the one with the lowest polarity, so that's going to be, sorry, the one with the lowest polarity, the one with the smallest difference. That one's going to have my smallest difference, and it asks me to circle the structure. So it's going to be that one, because those two numbers are closer than those two numbers and those two numbers. If you wanted to, we could work it out. So the difference, delta just means different. That's going to be 1.1. That's going to be 0 0.8. And that's going to be 0 0.5. Lowest or smallest difference means that that one's going to have it. Now we're still, for the next question, we're still looking at these pictures. Now this time it asks, explain why, explain fully why, of these three chlorides, silicon tetrachloride 
is the most soluble in hexane. So we're talking about soluble, so like dissolves like. Now, that never gets you a mark on its own. This question would be worth two marks. That on its own never gets you even one mark. So don't feel like that is an answer. It helps you get towards the answer. So why, so it's silicon tetrachloride. So silicon it is symmetrical. So it is nonpolar. A phosphorus, so the PCL3 and SCL2, those are um, asymmetric. They've got um, a point to them, so they are polar. So we know that this one is nonpolar, these two are polar. Like dissolves like. So even if you weren't sure, if like dissolves like, we must be able to say that hexane is polar. Hexane is nonpolar. Um, hexane is a hydrocarbon, so it is C6H14. Um, so it's definitely nonpolar because it only contains carbon and hydrogen bonds. So they've got a difference in electronegativity. So nonpolar solvents dissolve nonpolar compounds. So that nonpolar dissolves nonpolar can get you a mark, but like dissolves like cannot, because you need to identify what the like is in that sentence, and you would also get a mark for showing that that one's nonpolar and these ones are polar. Our next question, which is almost our final question, you'll be glad to hear, um, is on chromatography. Now this one, and um, that's A, B, C, D, E, and F. This one is not a past paper question, and um, there are limited examples because chromatography is quite new um, to that, and I didn't want to give you a question that you're going to be asked in um, either your actual exam or your prelim. So this is just an example question. Each one would be worth one mark. So we've got a gas chromatogram, and each one of these represents a compound. We've got numbers at the bottom, so we've got 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, and that's our time. And then we've got our strength of absorbance. So it says how many substances are identified in the sample? All we need to do is count the number of peaks. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Which substance had the shortest retention time? So that's going to be the one with the smallest time. So that is A. Which two substances were present in the sample in equal amounts? Well, the strength is going to be related to how much there is, and the two that have the same amount are B and C. Which substance was present in the greatest quantity? Well, that's going to be the one that's the tallest, so that's going to be F. And finally, which substance had the greatest affinity for the stationary phase? Now, the stationary phase, phase is the bit that doesn't move. So if you have affinity for the stationary phase, you're going to stay stuck to that stationary phase for as long as possible, which means you're going to stay in the chromatography sampling machine for the longest time. So that's also going to be F. The one that has the longest time is the one at the stationary phase. If that question had been for the mobile phase, mobile phase, it would have been A. I've got one more question and it's just an example of the type of problem solving question you might get. And here it is. So it's where, apologies for that, um, it is where you get given information about a chemical and 
some property of it and you have to kind of problem solve how much of that chemical you would need or how much of um, a particular element is in that substance. So the recommended adult female intake is 14.8 milligrams of iron per day. 100 grams of breakfast cereal contains twin, uh, 12 uh, milligrams of iron. So 100 grams means 12 milligrams, 12.0 milligrams. Calculate the percentage of the recommended daily amount. So recommended daily amount, that is 14.8. Um, so calculate the recommended daily amount of iron provided for an adult female for a 30 gram. So 30 gram goes to what? So that was 12.0. This is proportion. So to do this, it is going to be 12.0 um, divide by 100 and multiply by 30. So 12 divided by 100, sorry, just show you that I'm actually doing it, equals 0 0.12 multiplied by 30 equals 3.6 milligrams. That gets us one mark. For our second mark, what percentage is that? So that's 3.6 divided by 14.8 multiplied by 100. So 3.6 divided by 14.8 equals, multiply it by 100, and I'm going to take that to one decimal place, so that equals 24.3. So that is all of the types of question that you could get asked in this September exam. Um, hopefully this has given you some guidance for how to tackle those types of question, and thank you for um, sticking through this video and hopefully it helps.